All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Adrian. I am the National Director of Roots and Shoots USA. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the members of the 2020 US National Youth Leadership Council, a council that I myself was a part of many years ago. The NYLC is made up of high schoolers from around the country who represent some of the best and brightest young leaders of our program. Many serve as leaders of their own Roots and Shoots groups and all are using their voices to make positive change happen in their communities. Every year, the NYLC meets for several days to get to know one another, to troubleshoot and collaborate on their projects and participate in professional development training and build lasting friendships. Due to the pandemic, this year's in-person event was replaced with a virtual one. And while we're disappointed to not be together, it does afford us the unique opportunity to invite all of you to listen in on their presentations as they talk about their passions, projects, and plans. Thank you for joining us. You'll be hearing from 22 members of the National Youth Leadership Council who will present for a few minutes each. We'll be live until about 3 p.m. Eastern. Please bear with us as we navigate any technical difficulties that arise. We're just gonna do our best to go with the flow. So without further ado, we'll kick off our presentations with Olivia. Passing it on to you, Olivia. All right. Can you hear me and can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect, all right. All right, let me get this out of the way. Okay, so hello, my name is Olivia. I am from Michigan and this is my fourth year on the NYLC. Okay, so first off, a couple things. Um, I absolutely love being outside, camping, hiking, backpacking, running. Um, just, it's my element, it's where I like to be. Um, I absolutely love my dogs, Clark and Lola. You can see them at the top there. And my cats, Darth Vader and Dr. Meow Meows. Clark is my little running buddy and Lola is always up for an adventure. So I've been part of many different campaigns and projects over the past few years um, that are solving different issues that are happening around the world. For five summers, I was a volunteer at the Leslie Science and Nature Center and also a youth guidance team member, uh, where I was not only able to help kids explore the natural areas around us, but also teach them to protect it. I participate in monthly trash pickups uh, with the company Keep Nature Wild. And in the last few months, I've cleaned up over 150 pounds of trash along beaches and roads. Uh, I also had the opportunity to lobby for equal access to education in Congress, as well as selected as a 2019 Her Lead Fellow, uh, joining a group of incredibly inspirational folks from around the country. So now this brings me to my main and most consistent project. When I was in sixth grade, I approached my teachers with the idea to raise money to buy a bike through World Vision to help a girl get an education. Education has always been something that is really important to me. And I wanted to find a way to help more young people around the world uh, get the education that they fundamentally deserve. Throughout the one week fundraiser, I found that it was incredibly difficult to get my classmates to donate money. And my teacher ended up donating like the last $30 so we could purchase the bike. Um, but the next year I applied for and won the Lawrence Carolyn Award, a $500 scholarship that allowed me to kick off my project. The essay I wrote for the contest inspired me to come up with the idea of selling wire crafted wire bikes uh, to help raise money for an organization called World Bicycle Relief, a global nonprofit that assembles, designs, and distributes Buffalo bikes to people in developing countries so they can gain access to education, healthcare, and work. With the help of my mom, I created the, organ the charitable organization Good Spokes with the idea of using passion to create change. Good Spokes is kind of a play in words of the phrase good folks, so good people doing good in their community. Throughout the next three years, I attended various community events with my wire bikes, which were much updated from the original design and also some watercolor cards. Um, I would, not only was I able to raise money for a cause and organization that I cared so much about, but I was also able to discuss the education gap uh, with people of my community. 
I found that people were a lot more likely to purchase something that went towards a good cause than just donating the money directly. I've always wanted good spokes to be something that grew with me, that I always worked on in some capacity and expanded to fund projects in my own community. As I grew up, had my own life struggles, I began to feel very self-conscious of my art, thinking it wasn't good enough, and I lost some of the motivation to keep the organization running. I got involved with other projects, other leadership programs, and my interests changed. I felt lost and not sure what to do next with Good Spokes. But at the beginning of this year, I decided to shed those layers of self-doubt and got excited about my work again. And as I like to call it, Good Spokes 2.0 was born. <laughs> I got really into block printing. Uh, there's just something really relaxing about it. After a week of trying out different designs, I decided to make it a good spokes project. I carved and printed six different images onto art, onto cards and prints, and finally, after years, created an Etsy shop to sell my work on a digital platform. I raised over $100 total that was donated between five different organizations, the Humane Society of Huron Valley, the Leslie Science and Nature Center, Heal the Bay, the Jane Goodall Institute, and World Bicycle Relief. I also got really into digital drawing and designed this No Planet B uh, design and got it printed on stickers, shirts, and sweatshirts with all the proceeds going to the Jane Goodall Institute. Throughout the two-week campaign, I raised $100 for JGI and also got to see art that I loved go from the screen of my iPad to a physical item that people used. For Pride this year, I had stickers printed and shipped to me instead of doing it through Redbubble like I did with the No Planet B campaign. Uh, the proceeds from these go to the Trevor Project, an organization providing support and crisis resources to LGBTQ plus young people. I still have plenty of these stickers left, um, but so far it's raised about $10 for the organization. And to continue with the digital art theme, at the end of May, I created digital portraits of people's pets for a $15 donation to my local Humane Society. Over the course of two weeks, I raised $1,920, received 88 orders and 141 portraits. I've never had this much of a response before, um, so it was definitely a learning experience. But my favorite part was just hearing about all of the stories people would send along with their pictures of their pet and just hearing about how much they loved them. So Good Spokes, like I said, is something that I always want to grow with me and something that I'm always working on and evolving. Most importantly, I wanna keep creating, exploring different types of art and keeping and keep doing what I love, using my passion to create positive change in my community. This is the Good Spokes website and Etsy page if you are interested, but thank you so much for your time and for learning about all of my work. Thank you, Olivia. Next up, we have April. April, are you ready? Uh, yes, let me just start my screen share. Okay, so just to make sure, can everybody hear me and then see my slides? Yes. Okay, thank you. So hi everybody, my name is April. Um, I'm incredibly excited to be here today with you all. This is my second year on the NYLC, um, so it's really nice to see some familiar faces and then also meet new people. So a little bit about me. I'm calling in from sunny, sunny Tucson, Arizona. Um, I'm a senior at Basis Oro Valley and um, I'm an aspiring CS major looking to be on the pre-med track. And I've also been vegetarian for six years. So going into some of the projects I've worked on. So one of my most recent projects is Notes of Hope. So previously this project was known as Lighting Up Lives, um, but we went through some rebranding due to some trademark name issues. So I started this project with the help of my younger sister, Hannah. Um, music has always been a passion of mine, and we created this project to help accompany and bring hope to the senior populations, um, especially during this time of social isolation where um, they're more heavily social distanced from the rest of us. So this project does this by hosting virtual recitals, um, entertaining the elderly while at the same time providing youth with many different unique performance opportunities. 
So here is just a quick snapshot of our YouTube channel. Um, we post videos about once a week and we would love it if everybody could go subscribe and support us. Um, we had, do have a collection of about 30 plus videos and then we're working on expanding our organization. Um, but my younger sister Hannah will talk more about that in her presentation. So our group um, did have some news article um, coverage, so which this was really exciting for us. Um, and then I'll put the link in the chat afterwards in case anybody wants to read this. Um, so we've also been working with some international musicians on some collaborations. So one of the pieces that we have coming up is Only Time by Enya. And this is um, with a piano duet instrumental and then a voice um, singing by Orsi's Music. So we are really um, excited for that collaboration. So touching on the more STEM related aspects of my work, um, last summer I was granted the wonderful opportunity to participate in the Pioneer Academics Research and environmental engineering and more specifically water resources during this program. So some of you may remember um, this part of my presentation from last year and I would like to give everybody an update. So during this program, I learned about the physics behind particle settling, um, wastewater systems, and much, much more. And so I decided to take the research paper that I um, ended up with during this program and all the experience that I gained testing water uh, quality samples and designing a filtration system. And I took all this work and I decided to present virtually at the annual Arizona Water Conference 2020. Um, so there are many professionals there from hydrology, hydrologists, consultants um, to even the mayor of Phoenix, which was very exciting and nerve wracking at the same time. So something that I've learned through this experience, um, especially over the past years, is to always take everything one step further and to do your absolute best and never be scared to reach out and grab those opportunities that pass you by. Um, being scared is always part of a learning process and putting yourself outside of your comfort zone will ultimately help you learn, grow and develop into just an amazing person. And then here's just a picture of me collecting water samples. Okay, so finally, one of the most recent things that I've been a part of is the STEM Chats internship program. So I actually heard about this opportunity from one of my fellow council members. Um, shout out to Mahir on the call. So STEM Chats is a youth led NGO with the goal of shattering barriers in the STEM fields. And we do this by providing a transformative peer to peer um, education. So STEM Chats has many programs um, and more specifically, I'm interning at the Blueprint team department uh, where we are designing and then formatting a sample research journal, um, which publishes high school work. So many of you guys are probably wondering, how does this all relate to Roots and Shoots? And that's an excellent question, which I'll answer next. So being a part of Roots and Shoots has helped me to discover my passions and has really provided me with so many unique opportunities um, and just amazing resources. And then listening to my fellow NYLC members makes me realize just how inspirational and how absolutely beautiful each and every one of us is as human beings. And I'm extremely grateful to be part of this compassionate and loving community. And then with that, I'll open the floor up to any questions that anybody might have. Thank you, April. We're extremely grateful to have you a part of our Roots and Shoots family. <laughs> I think to, to make sure we have time for everybody's presentations, we'll move on to the next one. So next up is Rachel. Are you ready, Rachel? Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um. All right. Um, so hi, I'm Rachel. Um, some fun facts about me. I have two cats, you can see right there. I have celiac disease, which is an autoimmune disorder where I essentially can't eat gluten or else bad things will happen. And then I'm also a huge Dungeons and Dragons fan. Um, I helped to start a club in my school and it's a big passion of mine. <laughs> so I also helped to start this year, the Roots and Shoots Club at my school. Uh, we have uh, around 15 participants, and we've done two projects this year. The first one is a beach cleanup at the Santa Monica Beach. 
uh, we had participants sign up, we made homemade sifters, and unfortunately, we picked the one day in LA that it rained. So we were going to uh, push it back to the next uh, semester, but that was a semester of quarantine, so that unfortunately ne never ended up happening. We also, uh, over quarantine, did a new project that uh, made cards with senior citizens that are stuck at home. Uh, we partnered with the program Meals on Wheels in the chapter that is in West LA. And we helped make over 100 cards with senior citizens. Um, these cards had fun little phrases like, uh, stay safe and have a nice day. And they had little cute illustrations of them. Another project that I do pretty consistently around the fall is lunch bags for the Downtown Women's Center. The Downtown Women's Center is a shelter for formerly homeless or currently homeless women and children. Uh, they provide resources like job training and uh, daily meals and temporary housing and just a safe space for women and children. So what I do, I've done this for around five years, is gather my neighbors and get donations and then buy food to make snack bags. Um, these snack bags have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich in them they have a granola bar, they have a water bottle, they have a napkin, and they have an orange. Um, all this to say provides a good lunch um, to for the woman to grab and go if they need it. And lastly, a pro another project that I've done this year is the Ally Education Project. So this project came out of the George Floyd protests, and my friend and I felt that we needed to do something to help but we didn't want to overshadow um, activists. So we created the Ally Education Project as a way to help people who didn't really know where to start um, in their education process. So what it is, is a 10 day challenge. Um, each day has a podcast, it has a film, and it has a topic to research. And this is to help make uh, the process of learning about the problems Black people face in America more manageable. It is by no means perfect, but it is hopefully a jumping off point uh, for people who are interested in, that, um, in learning more. Um, you can find us in the Roots and Shoots project profile section by just looking up Ally Education Project and on our Instagram account. Um, and yeah, that's, those are my projects. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to hear them. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you for sharing about your amazing work. Alrighty, next up we have Kate. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so hi, I'm Kate. Um, I'm an incoming 10th grader from the Los Angeles area. I just wanted to say how glad I am to be in the NYLC. You guys all amaze me and are so inspiring. Um, a little bit about me. I'm an artist. I'm a drummer in a band and a tennis player. I care very deeply about the environment and gun control, animal rights, and just the world and people around me. And I definitely watched a little too much TikTok this summer. Um, so kind of how I got started in Roots and Shoots and the NYLC. Um, I joined Roots and Shoots in sixth grade and my teacher became my biggest inspiration and mentor. And I just fell in love with the program. Um, some of my favorite projects I did was the Diversity Color Run, the Hygiene Drive, and this Thanksgiving Breakfast for the Homeless. But... Yeah, the turning point for me was really seeing Jane speak and she just inspired me to do more. You guys all know she's amazing. Um, so she inspired me to kind of create my own Roots and Shoots group at my high school. Um, and some of my favorite projects we did this year was a toy drive, um, raising money for the Australian wildfires. And we did a thank you campaign for the first responders. Um, so my newest project is the Freedom Writers Mentorship. To give you some background, the Freedom Writers is an innovative methodology that kind of helps educators make a difference in their classroom and inspire kids to make a difference in their lives and communities. 
Um, by training with these freedom writers and educators, I'm able to support these kids and kind of learn how to best, um, I don't know, be a support system for them. Um, these kids are going to foster care or tough conditions at home and the freedom writers are just kind of there to guide them and inspire them to do, to do different. Um, so Team Enough is kind of my favorite project. It's my biggest project. Um, and I started by finding the LA section of Team Enough, which is the youth organization part of Brady. Um, Brady is a gun control organization um, in nationwide. Um, this summer, we were planning on lobbying for a micro stamping bill up in Sacramento, but obviously that couldn't happen. So instead, we took all of the Team Enough chapters in California and launched a virtual lobbying effort. Um, so we trained and organized for this micro stamping bill amendment, and we lobbied for state senators and their staff. And I'm so happy to say that the bill passed through the California State Assembly and the Public Safety Committee. So it is now on the way to the Senate. So I kind of wanted to take a minute to talk about the value of virtual lobbying as it really opens up doors for and can revolutionize the future of activism. Um, we, one of the main reasons we did lobby was not only for the micro stamping bill, what, but was also to push for virtual lobbying post COVID. Um, so many kids and adults don't have the means and access to go up to Sacramento or go up to lobbying. They can't miss school or it's too expensive. So by virtual lobbying, it really broadens our participation and allows everyone to be able to do it. Also, we were able to use the chat feature to share data and rebuttals um, and communicate with each other while, sim like while we were lobbying. Also, it was easier for senators to join a call when they might have not been able to set up a meeting with us. Um, lastly, um, right now we're doing a creating 2020 videos for the um, election, um, kind of a PSA campaign to promote gun sense candidates. Um, so the video idea is basically called the best part of quarantine is um, people can say the best part of quarantine is waking up late or um, online school or whatever it may be. And then the last part of quarantine is not worrying about getting shot on my way home from school, not worrying about a school shooting. So kind of just to bring awareness to the issue and to promote gun sense candidates. And lastly, we're doing a social media campaign called Shoot Hoops Not Guns, um, which we're working on. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Next up we have Daniel. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Here we go. I'm going to share my screen. So this is my project. Um, it's called Making Soil. I started it about, I'd say at the beginning of the year. So I just wanted to inform you guys that actually the key to, a really big key to changing uh, the climate is right under our feet in the soil that we walk on and use to grow food. So I'd like to give you a quick backstory on how um, on how the soil really did change American history. So the Dust Bowl, this was something that happened between 1930 and 1941, the series of dust storms, very, very serious dust storms that crossed 19 states, including Colorado, Kansas, and Oklahoma. As you can see, it actually basically swallowed this car and it destroyed towns, farms, and worst of all, crops, because that was these people's main source of food. And it made it so far across the country, it made it to the president's desk. So it's kind of sad to say, but these people did bring it on themselves. And I don't really, you know, I don't like to say that, but they stripped the natural land that they had uh, of across a hundred million acres of land. They managed to strip every single crop and they created monocrops, which is a singular crop like corn or soy or, or whatever it is going just one crop, nothing else. And it destroyed the nature and it created dust storms. And many different people came to show them what they were doing wasn't really, well, completely wrong. And Native Americans came and people from colleges came and they refused help. And it continued on and it be, lasted 11 years. So this is a before picture, as you can see up above of the field. It's very profuse. It has actually 500 to 700 different species of plants. So that's a lot of different species. And after you can see their land 
after the Dust Bowls and after they used their monocropping and it became a beach, but there's no ocean. So now 90 years after the greatest climate disaster of all time in this country, um, now we're kind of starting to do it again. Now in Florida, there's a 2020 citrus disaster, uh, the $7 billion Florida citrus industry. That's a lot of money. That's a dollar from every human being. And it's being attacked by a bacteria in the tree that is making sure the oranges do not turn orange. They fall off and they rot. Therefore, they cannot make any money. So uh, they're going to flop. And their, their solution in Florida for the citrus uh, disease is to cut down every single citrus tree in the state and replant them all over again. Yeah, cut down every single tree. And they did that exact thing in the Dust Bowl. Their solution was to pave over all the land. But there's one guy who decided he was gonna use this thing called plant diversity, which is what I've really been working on. And it's where you put diverse different plants around your one main plant, which is of course citrus trees. And his trees actually healed and he's making money. So my project is called Making Soil. So I created my project. I built, I built a handmade wooden compost bin for my community and to create a diverse habitat for animals and plants so I could have my neighbors eating food they grow and they could be empowered to have gardens like mine. And so my neighbors actually started their gardens, which is kind of wild because these are people that are afraid of dirt. And I was able to create them to, build, to plant milkweed and have diverse plants for habitat for bumblebees, butterflies, owls, raccoons, all these different animals that can be in my Los Angeles backyard and feel safe and feel like they have a nature sanctuary. But the interesting thing I learned is that you want your project to be like this solving thing for the whole world. And I thought it was, but I can never create enough compost to really, really fix the issue we have with, uh, with agriculture in this country. Because agriculture takes so, it's, takes, it's such an uh, impact on the environment. But diverse soils, this, um, this idea of plant diversity takes 21.7% more carbon out of the air, which is a lot more. It also creates organic food. You can have organic food for people to live on, cut down on meat, which is, you know, obviously a big, big toll on the environment. And it also filters water, naturally filters water. And it's really the special cycle. So I, in, you know, in doing my project, I learned that that was the big step. And, you know, I'm taking steps in the future to, you know, cook food for homeless with my food that I grow in my gardens. And it's a very special project that I can, you know, lead forward with this plant diversity. So I'd like to leave you with just one quote. It's, if we surrender to Earth's intelligence, we could rise up rooted like a tree. Now, people don't really want to surrender to Earth's intelligence. It's a hard thing to say that the Earth is more intelligent than a human being. And I, you know, I wasn't sure that I could, you know, I could fully jump and I, and you know, it's hard, but it's true. The earth has the intelligence that we need to solve the climate issue. And it all starts with plant diversity and soil. And that's my project. My name is Daniel. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. Next up, we have Hannah. Hannah, are you ready? Um. Yes, can you hear me? Or yes, I can hear you. Um, okay, so uh, can anyone see my uh, presentation? Right. Yes. Okay, um, so hi everyone, my name is Hannah and this is my presentation, so. <laughs> Um, so I want to introduce you guys to me a little first. So I'm from Tucson, Arizona. There's a lot of cacti um, and mountains. So, and a couple hobbies I have. Um, I play the violin in the right corner. That's a picture of my actual violin because I thought it would be fun to show you guys. And another hobby of mine is writing. I also really like writing. Um, so that writing sample in the bottom corner is from an essay I wrote about vegan chocolate cake. So yeah, um, that's a little bit about me. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Notes of Hope, the project that I started with my sister. Um, I want to talk about our impact and progress. So we have played in person at a couple of senior care homes, including the Brookdale Senior Living and Desert Springs Gracious Retirement Living. Um, all the seniors there were so nice and I'm very grateful for them. <laughs> uh, we also recently did a virtual concert for Fidelity Care Corner and that was definitely a new experience, but I really liked it. 
And we have over 30 YouTube videos on our Notes of Hope channel so far. So I really hope you check that out. Uh, me and my sister have made a lot of progress with this so far and I'm very happy about that. Uh, so I also wanna talk about Notes of Hope in the future. So our plan is to expand from a project to a youth-led organization by recruiting team members to help with specific tasks such as marketing, outreach, et cetera, and diversifying the types of music genres and instruments by inviting more youth musicians to join. Uh, currently, because of quarantine, it is a little hard to reach out to more musicians, but it's a work in progress. Um, so, ooh, sorry. so another project I wanted to talk about is a project I started called the Bookmark Project. So the issue I wanted to combat was um, many people aren't very educated about veganism and vegetarianism and animal welfare. And I thought libraries would be the perfect place to do that because that's where people of all ages from toddlers to seniors come to read and study to discover new information. So it would be the perfect place to spread uh, information about activism for the animals uh, and the earth. So how I'm gonna do this, um, I'm gonna hand out uh, handmade bookmarks along with pamphlets about veganism, vegetarianism, and animal welfare. Uh, currently because of quarantine, um, libraries in Tucson are not open to this kind of project. So I'm right now selling them online and handing them out to neighbors and friends and family to as many people as I can find. Um, so here are a couple images of the bookmarks and pamphlets. Yeah, um, so that's a little bit of that. Um, I also wanna talk about how Roots and Shoots has helped me. So I first discovered the uh, Roots and Shoots in third grade. Uh, we were asked to do a project and we had to pick one person and I picked Jane Goodall. Couldn't have picked a better person. <laughs> um, that really helped me discover the NYLC along with my sister. And it's given me a community of amazing people. Everyone here is so wonderful and I'm so thankful for all of you. Uh, yeah, you're my source of inspiration and support. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Hannah. Next up is Cami. I think you're muted, Cami. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yep, there you are. Great. Let me just share my screen. Share. Let me present mode. Cool. Hi, I'm Cami. I am from Los Angeles, California. This is my fourth year on the NYLC. I'm in college, so I'm on the college council, um, but I'll share a little bit about my previous work in high school and what inspired me to do what I want to do in college and my passions. So I'm currently attending UC Berkeley. I'm a rising junior. Right now, I've changed my major a couple of times, but currently I am molecular environmental biology. Um, which is very environmental science focused. And my focus is animal health and behavior. And there's usually a few different tracks you can do with animal health and behavior is you can become a veterinarian. Um, I have many friends that are doing that, but my focus is more of animal research and behavioral research. And um, I was the founder of my Roots and Shoots Club at my high school. And I'm also an alumna of Girl Scouts USA, and I've gone on to earn my gold award when I was in high school also. And Girl Scouts has honestly inspired me to be more passionate about the environment since I was a little girl. So some high school projects that I did with my Roots and Shoots group, we did some tree plantings, we did school and beach cleanups. And I also, my favorite project was the student garden on campus, which I have a little picture of. Um, one of the NYLC members, Noah Weiss and I, worked on this garden um, and it's one of our favorite projects that we got to plan within two months span and our school just let us go for it. Um, I also was an ASB for my student government environmental commissioner and um, I planned this position all on my own to present to them and 
give them the idea that we need a person on our student government that is in charge of all the green clubs on campus and to bring them together as one giant green team. And I also was a student member on my environmental commission for my city council. And that was really fun because we were able to present ideas to city council about eco-friendly plans for the bills that they were passing and also being able to plan um, citywide events like the annual Earth Day and Arbor Day. So some previous work that I did the past two years, um, I was my sorority sustainability chair. And this was a really fun position because I got to educate my chapter on sustainable practices and just being able to teach them how to compost and recycle correctly. And I also worked with a fraternity to adopt compostable cups instead and ditch the red solo cups, which are very detrimental to the environment. Last summer, I was a Harbo Technologies intern, which is located in Israel. And I was there for the duration of the summer. And they're an environmental startup that sells their reusable oil spill booms, which I have a picture on the right to show you like what it looks like. And most oil companies and response companies use oil booms that are um, one time use and then they throw them out and they're very bulky, they're very big. And this company decided to create reusable ones and so that they can use them over and over again. And I researched oil spill response policy within the Southern US during my time as an intern. So some current work that I've been up to the past year, um, I'm on my ASUC's sustainability team and I help educate the school community on how to live a sustainable lifestyle while you're in college dorms. And we also are currently working on fixing the website and researching grant opportunities for our projects for the upcoming year. My favorite thing that I get to do at school, which I'm very bummed that it's not happening this fall, but we're still gonna try to make it work as much as we can remotely, is Hollow for Hunger. And there we make mini hollows. We prepare mini hollows with the community that we invite and we sell them for about $3. And we have a charity partners and they include the Berkeley Food Pantry and Mazone Food Bank, which is a Jewish nonprofit national organization. And then finally, I get to share my newest edition that I'm so excited about. Um, the, I'm now part of the Tuco Tuco Research Lab very funny name. Those are what the animals are. They're kind of rodent-like. They're from Argentina um, and they're super cute. And um, the focus of the study is vertebrate social behavior and population biology. Um, what, I what I get to do in the lab is I mostly take care of them, make sure they're healthy and happy and I feed them. Um, but as I keep working in the lab, I'll be able to pick up some independent research projects on my own. But it's really amazing to be part of a lab where I can honestly like see their behavior like growing on me every day and really see their emotions like like in each and every one of them. It's just so amazing like just seeing that come out. And I hope that one day I'll be able to be a wildlife behavior researcher and hopefully conduct research of my own and care for wild animals that, you know, need our help. Thank you. That's Thank it, you. I'm gonna stop. Thank you so yep. much, Jenny. Up next, we have Joseph. Can everyone see me and also see my screen? Yes, you're good to go. All right. Give me a second. All right. So my name is Joseph. I am calling in from Omaha, Nebraska. I'm really proud of, I'm really excited to be part of this year's NYLC. And I have to say a lot of you guys have inspired me with all your work and hopefully I can provide a little bit of inspiration back. And so my project is truly like the epitome of like how one action can truly cause like a cascading effect of change. So we're first going to talk about the roots of it uh, and then growth and then also how COVID has impacted uh, this project. So the roots of my project is pretty much uh, how it started is because of two very important intersections of my life. First part is I was raised by my grandmother until I was five. And so I've always felt indebted to her like for raising me during that period. And also uh, I have also played violin for uh, since fourth grade and I fell in love with it. So in seventh grade, I decided to play at senior re retirement communities 
to, to, to give back to the community. Uh, soon my friends found out about it and so they also wanted to join and so we created what we call the Dreams Cordae of Omaha and started performing at the senior living communities. Uh, soon that would expand with other members from my church wanting to join and creating joy group and also helping you can see it expand from uh, a few students to a lot more students there. We also within the first year expanded from two senior living communities to about seven uh, each one we perform at like once a month pretty much and soon after that we added a mentoring program because some of the younger musicians in the group simply couldn't play some of the other pieces and so we had some of the older students starting, starting to mentor some of the younger students which leads us to where we where joy music uh, as we call ourselves is today uh, joy music now provides music mentorship for the youth across the city of Omaha uh, whether you're part of the performing group or not uh, it also helps raise cultural awareness through community events as well as concerts at senior living communities. We also do uh, deliver. We also do, uh, do food deliveries, whether it's cookie cookie drives or present or gift drives and stuff like that. So a lot of our uh, volunteering events were physical. So when COVID hit, uh, a lot of our volunteer events had to be canceled. But we were able to adapt pretty quickly. Uh, we first. Uh, our first goal was to target the isolated seniors, whether it be performing concerts in front of their front lawns or like giving them gifts and deliveries. And soon we also did those gifts and deliveries for senior living communities as well. So, uh, and then being inspired by a few of the NYLC, NYLC members, we also started doing a card campaign and also writing thank you cards and appreciative notes to the elderly. We also started experimenting with virtual music as well as uh, greeting videos as well. And that has really helped expand like my project. Uh, and so originally prior to COVID, we were primarily based in Omaha. And also we had a branch in Taiwan that I started about uh, two, two winters ago when I visited Taiwan, helped start up a group, a uh, branch of Joy Music there. However, with uh, due to COVID and our expansion on the virtual platform side of things, we've been able to expand to across the impacting senior living community across the nation, as well as in the UK, as well as in our base in Taiwan. We, our volunteers are now not just in the city of Omaha. We also have now have a branch in DC, Morocco, Spain, and Taiwan because of uh, our ability to meet, meet virtually and plan events virtually and do all of that. So I'm hoping that through my presentation today that you can see how the single action of me performing at a senior living community all those years ago in seventh grade has five years later blossomed to having uh, uh, a project that now expands the globe with volunteers across the globe affecting people across the globe. So I'm really hoping that this will help give you an inner drive to commit more change and do those actions that help make the world a better, better place. For more information, you can visit our YouTube, Instagram, or acapella, or you can just reach me by my email. Thank you so much, Joseph. That was incredible. Next up, we have Mahir. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yep, you're good. To okay, so I'm gonna get started. So hello everyone. I hope everyone's having a fantastic Saturday. So I'm really excited to share my experience with you and kind of dig deeper into Kissimmee and what I've done on behalf of Roots and Shoots. So, um, hold on. Okay, yeah, so my story, um, I'm from Kissimmee, Florida. If you don't know where that is, that's right next to Disney World, um, somewhere near there. And I am a first year National Youth Leadership Council member who wants to study public health and um, study law at the same time to kind of bridge the gaps and prevent medical inequality on a global scale. So I'm a rising IB senior at Gateway High School in Kissimmee, Florida, and I am working with my lovely friend, teacher, and mentor, Ms. Erdman, who is hopefully watching this, and we are attempting to do the impossible in Kissimmee to create change and promote togetherness and cooperation. So before I get into kind of what I'm doing on behalf of Roots and Shoots, aside from Roots and Shoots, I'm working on STEM Chat, something that April had mentioned prior, and I am actually a program lead for a bi-weekly newsletter that um, supplies uh, bi-weekly emails and um, information to over 500 subscribers. And I also am a co-founder of a youth blog called Search as Society that kind of discusses um, topics that aren't really talked about by the youth generation. And so I 
sadly, I found Roots and Shoots this year, late this year in um, November 20 of 2019. But luckily, I was still able to join the National Youth Leadership Council. So when um, I created the chapter alongside Miss, alongside with Miss Erdman at Gateway High School, it was a very slow plot process due to COVID-19 complications and administrative complications. And we ended up not accomplishing as much as we wanted to. So by starting off in February, on the picture on the left, you'll see that we had a community icebreaker. So we wanted students to kind of identify environmental, animal, and social issues in their local community while giving them a map of Kissimmee and kind of trying to target what projects we want to handle and what projects we want to kind of tackle in our city. And so by the end of this month, we had decided that we wanted to kind of create a female hygiene equity campaign that would provide female hygiene products in all school bathrooms. And this project would have gone into effect after spring break. However, that kind of got canceled because of COVID. So because of COVID, you'll see in the middle picture that we started a virtual media campaign in which we started spreading awareness by creating flyers about coronavirus when it was still a kind of more unknown topic and people didn't really take it um, and handle it with as best as they could. So that's kind of what we did um, kind of in those months where we kind of had no choice but to sit down and watch what was gonna happen. And lastly, after trying to work hardly with administration, um, you can see on the right picture, that's a screenshot of Microsoft Teams, and we created a virtual tutoring system. And basically, um, that would allow students to talk to students about transitioning into a virtual online system and kind of talking about what we can do in the future and how we can help them with their academics and their social life. However, um, due to um, like administration's intentions to put the Roots and Shoots assistance um, last on the to-do list, we only had the last week of school to perform this act, which led very few people to kind of participate in our program. And um, as much as we appreciate the people who did participate, we still got to help a few people that um, needed it. And so this takes me to our certificate of recognition. We had so many failures this year and hardships and limited attention from our school. And our chapter finally had accomplished something. So when I got this email, I was more than excited. It was monumental. And to me and hopefully the school, um, this would be, our club would be taken much more seriously in the future and we would make change. Um, and after reading the email of the certificate of recognition and our accomplishments, I began reflecting. And this is kind of when I connected the importance of failure and to achieve what we want to. And that's when I started digging deeper and talking about what worked and what didn't work. So I looked deeper at the four step formula. What did we do wrong? What did we not do? So when we are talking about getting engaged, we did that. We kind of tackled, we um, put on announcements, we got students to join our club. When we talked about uh, mapping, we had students participate in a community icebreaker where they would target items in their local community in their area that are very important to them. And then when we talk about taking action, um, we tried as best as we could. Um, uh, this year was mainly a foundational step in the Gateway Roots and Shoots chapter, but there was a lot of COVID complications and administration arrogance. However, when I looked upon Celebrate, um, something didn't click. What if there was nothing to celebrate? And that's kind of when I started to reflect. And um, that's kind of when reflecting and review became an essential part of our own rendition of the four-step formula. And it kind of reminded me that adapt, ad, adapt to, adaptability is vital in Kissimmee. And we see that review um, on the right is very important and kind of resonates with the Kissimmee message more as we try to tackle kind of social justice and environmental um, issues. So when we looked at review, we looked at reflecting and encouraging, including embracing um, kind of the projects that we did. And something that we felt that was not included in Celebrate was kind of reflecting and looking back on, okay, yeah, we did this, but what could we do better for next time? We wanna make sure that the impact we have is longstanding and it stands against um, the millions of people that um, are kind of pushing against uh, the change makers in the world. And we want to promote the youth. We want to promote education. And that's kind of when um, we brought review back into the equation. And hopefully this is something that is more implemented this year. And hopefully that's what we can do. However, virtual schooling and kind of COVID-19 complications might arise. But what our main point is, is that we want to reflect on the good and bad. And we want to encourage people. We want to respect and honor what we've done, yet reflect on what we could do better and how we can make a greater impact on the world. So then that's when it comes to um, reflecting on Kissimmee. So what we basically learned is that we're a very diverse community and we lack the diversity in knowledge and thought. 
And that's mainly because of the inequitable educational opportunities for each student. And that's where my work spreads. That's when I start working with STEM chats in search of society. And I work on political campaigns that kind of give people the foundation to gain knowledge in themselves and trust themselves to make good decisions. And so, some things we learn more about Roots and Shoes in Kissimmee is that it's people are not very adaptable and that the community is gonna be very hard to work with. However, people need and want change and there's silent voices in and outside of the school that we need to work with. And basically waking up Kissimmee is gonna be a tough job. So our plan because uh, of COVID is very fluid and we have a heavy focus on education of the public and openness and kind of digging deeper in ourselves and in our community while introducing new methods of growth and knowledge and openness to perspectives. And over the next year, um, we've created handbooks, guides and plans for the future, including kind of expanding on our period equity project, um, looking at sanitation, uh, equitable educational opportunities, as well as social and environmental justice. And um, most importantly, we will do the undoable and we will accomplish what was not accomplished over the past year. And um, I guess one of the biggest takeaways from this year and working with NYLC and hearing everyone's inspiring stories is that our work is worth it. No matter what um, uh, everyone is doing, everyone's work is very important to kind of taking the next step and changing the world. And so hopefully from my presentation, um, you got to dig deeper in Kissimmee with me and soon we will dig deeper in the world together. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Mahir. That was fantastic. Up next, we have Chloe. Chloe, we can't hear you, but I can. Sorry. Hear you. Okay, let me just share my screen. Perfect. All right, I see it. Okay. All right, so hello, everyone. My name is Chloe. I'm a rising high school senior from New York, and this is my first year on the council. And today I'll be talking about a composting project that was carried out by my Roots and Shoot group this past year. So for some context, before last year in my school, we didn't have a very good waste management system. The cafeteria options looked mostly like this, and the vast majority of people's waste just went directly into the trash. Several years ago, there was an attempt to reform our waste management, and a sorting system was introduced where people had to separate liquids, recyclables, food waste, and trash. But without any upkeep, that fell apart and pe people quickly gave it up. So last summer, my Roots and Shoots group decided to tackle the problem by starting a composting initiative. And after troubleshooting the previous attempt, we decided to start small, reducing contamination by just collecting and composting the lunch trays and then adding more elements as we went along. The implementation of the project involved a lot of research and planning from arranging the logistics to setting up all the infrastructure that we needed. But the biggest obstacle we faced while implementing our project was the question of how to change student behavior. Because when you introduce a fancy new system, um, you can introduce it. But as we saw before, there's no way to guarantee that people will actually follow it. And so, there are three things that we did to help us kind of work through this problem. The first thing we did is make sure that people knew what to do. We made announcements, sent out emails, and did basically whatever we could do to get the word out. We also made big signs, labeled all the bins, and set up the stations with clear pictures so people would know right away where and what to stack. And then once people know what to do, secondly, we wanted to make it as easy as possible for them to do it. So we increased accessibility by putting a tray stacking point next to or in front of every trash bin in the cafeteria and also having monitors next to stations to remind people what to do. And the last step was just to keep at it. It took a long time, a period of many weeks, but eventually most people did start composting their trays on their own and we began to monitor less and less frequency, frequently. And after all this, we found that our project worked. Before the school closed due to the pandemic, we had saved an estimated 5,500 trays from the landfill. And in a small school with only about 100 people per grade, this was a much larger number than we expected. And we were able to change people's behaviors and the culture of our school. 
from this composting project, we expanded with a bin for all compostable materials from packaging to food and not just the lunch trays. And we also incorporated it into other Roots and Shoots projects. For example, in February, we decided to host a candy gram fundraiser, but also wanted to spread word about the new phase of our compost project. So we found eco-friendly chocolate truffles with compostable wrappers, set up a table in our cafeteria, and let students send, mess send chocolates with positive messages to their peers. And in this way, we were able to both raise money and raise awareness because each person who bought a chocolate also got a free 30 second pitch about how they could dispose of the wrappers using our new compost bin. So other than how to get a school to start composting, what I learned from this project is that it takes a lot of persistence and time to change people's habits, but conservation is an ongoing process. And I think the work of all Roots and Shoots members is a testament to the fact that even through things like stacking lunch trays, we can all create genuine change. So thank you all for listening. Thank you so much, Chloe. Up next, we have Marissa. Can you hear me? And yes, I can. I start sharing my screen. There we go. Can you see the screen? Yes, I can. Okay, great. So hi, my name is Marissa and I'm from like the central New Jersey area. And this is my first year on the council. So at least in my opinion, one of the best places in New Jersey to go to is the beach, right? But there is kind of like a problem that, I mean, a lot of you may know about, you may not, um, is that even though there are, um, you know, designated trash and recycle bins um, at the beach, there are definitely still a lot of litter on the shores. So for a long time now, um, as you can tell from that picture, because obviously that's from a long time ago, I sadly did not have any recent pictures, um, but I've been doing beach sweeps twice a year through Clean Ocean Action, um, where we kind of collect as much trash as we can for a few hours, whether it's raining or not, and it has been raining times, and it's still fun. Um, and then we categorized it to try to kind of compile things later, the organization Clean Ocean action does that to try to figure out like the trends in plastic use versus not and what's left on the beach. Um, so then as I got into high school, um, I tried to kind of, because it used to just be like mainly my family, as I got into high school, I tried to kind of with my Roots and Shoots group kind of get other people involved. And I mean, at least this year for the spring one, we couldn't do it because of COVID, but um, I am still going to try to get more people to come to the events each year. And then so Kind of speaking of my high school, two of my big passions are, of course, the environment and also STEM and engineering. So the picture here kind of really helps to represent that. So this is the graphs that I made to look in the form of the Roots and Trues logo. So it's kind of, again, trying to like combine those two things. But nonetheless, I go to a very like engineering focused school and I want to try to bring the environment to it through a vertical garden. So right now I have like a bunch of bottles at my house awaiting this project um, and I kind of took you know these photos to kind of like get ideas I don't really think the watermelon one would be a good plan since it would be a hanging vertical garden a watermelon would be great but you know something like basil or something just trying to like bring that nature element to the school and have it like smell nice too so people notice it maybe um, so this is kind of where it would be and this is our goal here like kind of what we'd want to do and if you can kind of see here there are old ones so I did learn that this project has been tried like people have tried it in the past but I mean I kind of learned that even though they failed they didn't really finish it or something like that happened as it broke still want to try to like be persistent and get it in the end and hopefully even with COVID I can try to kind of like collect more bottles and you know get with other clubs to try to get it together like as a last like big thing to try to do even though we are kind of stuck so everyone can kind of see something that was made out of this time. So um, that's kind of like my two main projects. And I just want to, before I stop, I just want to say thank you to everyone. And I really love being on the council and getting to inspired by all the other members and hearing about all of their amazing projects and taking them to try to do at my school as well. And thank you. Thank you, Marissa. That was awesome. Next up, we have Abby. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. 
Can you see my screen? Not yet. Can you see it now? Perfect, uh-huh. Thank you. So hi everyone, my name is Abby and this is my fifth year on the Roots and Shoots NYLC. Um, and in this presentation, I'm just going to talk about um, three projects, um, Roots and Shoots projects that I've been working on in the past year. Um, but before I begin, I thought I'd just make a little bit of a personal connection and tell you three fun facts about me. Um, so my favorite animal is the Sumatran rhino. I love them because they're one of the furriest rhino species. And um, my favorite insect is the monarch butterfly. I love to kayak and I am also learning to speak Finnish. Um, so my favorite Roots and Shoots project um, is called Keeper Hope It's Beautiful. And um, I first started this project when I joined the council and um, my main goal was to distribute three litter collection barrels along a community walking route in my neighborhood. Um, and since then, um, the program has kind of, or the project has grown into a townwide municipal program and committee um, where um, we have three goals, which are to educate people on the litter problem and why it's important um, to clean up the town and make sure that litter doesn't end up on the streets in the first place. Um, also litter reduction, so doing things like cleanups and litter prevention, so providing solutions um, to prevent litter from ending up um, in, the wild, in the wild areas and um, on the side of the road in the first place. Um, so some ways that we've done that aside from um, cleanups twice a year are we did a program called Spruce Up the Town where we planted and grew um, cedar tree saplings. Um, we thought we were, they were spruce trees, hence the name Spruce Up the Town. Um, but it was a fundraiser where we sold the saplings and um, that helped plant um, trees in our community while also um, raising money for Keep Hope Beautiful. Um, we also did a program called, um, well, it didn't really have a name, but it was uh, making uh, litter prevention bags, which you can see on the bottom photo on the slide. And these were handmade um, fabric bags that clasp onto the back of a headrest in a car. And that provides a place for people to put their trash um, in their car instead of um, feeling tempted to throw it out the window. And um, lastly, we did a program um, with uh, reusable cups in our community. Um, so we noticed that most of the littered items on, on the side of the roads were um, Dunkin' Donuts cups. So um, we decided to um, go around to local businesses and create a list of places that um, accept uh, reusable cups and Dunkin' Donuts is one of them. And so we posted that on social media in our website. And um, now the community has a place to go to if they want to um, avoid using um, single use plastic or styrofoam cups, um, they can go to that list and um, see where they can bring their reusable cup. Um, my most recent project is called A Community of Hope. And this is an Instagram page that I created at the start of the pandemic. And I just created this page because um, I wanted to uh, create a space where people could kind of escape from um, their news feeds that were filled with a lot of breaking news updates. I found that happening for myself and friends and family. Um, and this would just be a place to um, provide some good news updates and also just stress relief and anxiety relief and um, also some activities to do while staying at home. Um, so I do things like a good news roundup on some days where I collect um, from other pages, um, good news stories, and then I repost them to the Instagram story feature on our page. And um, I also, um, as you can see on the slide, um, post activity ideas and also some um, quotes and passages about hope, um, just because that's an important thing to have right now. And lastly, I really love volunteering in my community. Um, I've been volunteering at a place called Beacon Hospice since 2015. And um, what I do there is I'm, I'm an indirect volunteer. Um, so I don't go and visit with patients, um, except for around the holidays when we do um, Christmas caroling. But um, I knit blankets for the patients and also make um, bright cards and decorations um, on holidays. And then um, just any time of the year to brighten up their rooms and um, to kind of make it a little bit more cheerful and personal. And I also create something called a chart of life, um, which is basically a poster board with details about the patient's life. 
and this helps personalize the room. It helps them have pictures of them and their family um, and their favorite things in their room, but also it serves as a memory tool. So a lot of patients at the center um, have Alzheimer's and dementia. So um, when they have those charts in their room, when the doctors and staff come in, they can use it kind of as a tool to help the patient remember details about their life. Um, and lastly, um, this year, in the past few months, I've been um, doing census outreach and phone banking, the 2020 census. Um, and I really care about this because um, a complete count in 2020 would help communities receive um, all of the funding they would need for the next 10 years. So it's a really important um, thing to complete. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Abby. Next up, we have Claire. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, let me share my screen. Awesome, we can see it. All right, I'll go to the beginning. Hi, my name is Claire. I'm from Orlando. I don't really go to regular school, but I take classes at my local college, and this would be my second year on the council. So there are a lot of projects worldwide that address the B problem, but I was never really motivated to engage, but that was before I took a picture of a bee. I'm a macro photographer, and one day I caught a bee on a flower, and when I saw the picture full size when I got home, I was absolutely stunned because I didn't realize how pretty they were. And they're so intricate when you look at them super close up. And I instantly felt an emotional connection to bees and I wanted to help them. And I'm trying to use my photography to help other people have the same reaction that I did when I first saw one really close up. And besides building my website with my bee pictures, I'm also sharing my pictures with other bee projects. And this past Wednesday, I found out that Adobe is going to be spotlighting my photograph in a new ad campaign about young change makers. So hopefully the bees will get more love. Ah. So I am a type 1 diabetic. And that means I am insulin dependent and I have to take insulin all day long. And I wear a pump that gives me insulin. And every time I eat anything or drink anything with sugar in it or carbs, I have to take more. The other kind of diabetes, which is typically more well-known, is called type 2. Type 2 is when your body still makes some insulin, but has trouble regulating how much you need and how much it makes. And type 2 is usually caused by a bad diet and lack of exercise. And it's more common in poor communities because they have better access to unhealthy food. In the past 20 years, the price of insulin went from something like $15 to 350 for a single vial. Tip, uh, typically, I use three, three vials a month, um, but other diabetics use upwards of six. And the price of insulin is so high that many type 2 diabetics are forced to ration their insulin. And the higher the blood sugar you have, which is when you don't have enough insulin, the more likely you are to develop heart problems and other major health issues because it's harder for your body to pump blood that's the consistency of syrup. For example, like poor circulation to your outer extremities could lead to amputation. Also, the vein of the base of your skull just happens to be super, super thin. And when you have a high blood glucose, it has a really high incidence of stroke or death. And if someone were to have to get an amputation, just imagine how much harder it would be to, for them to keep their job or if they had another major health issue. And it's just a terrible cycle that once it starts, it just feeds on itself and things get just worse. I've been working with JDRF and Congressman Val Demings to advocate to get the cost of insulin and diabetic supplies to be more in line with the rest of the world. But right now this project is on hold because Ms. Val might be our next vice president, so her office isn't really doing much else at the current moment. My last project is called MindFlow. It's basically a device that hooks up to a faucet and a, or a shower. Like it usually looks a flow of water as like a water wheel kind of. And while the faucet's on, you can see how much water you've used and how much it costs to get the water and how much it costs to heat the water. My belief is that if you're an informed consumer, you might consume less. Uh, just a couple of facts. The average American home uses 200 gallons of water per day just for their indoor use. 
and approximately 150 of this water is used in our sinks and our showers with our direct control. So if each household just in America took only two showers a day, but those showers were two minutes shorter, we could conserve over 2 billion gallons a day just in the United States. But uh, I was working with a developer on a prototype for this project, but because of the pandemic, this project has also been put on hold. And that's it. Thank you so much, Claire. Thank you. Next up, we're gonna have a presentation from Anna. Hi everyone, my name is Anna Schilling and in my presentation today I'm just going to talk about myself and all the things that I'm interested in and the projects I've done for retention. So first of all, I'm going to give you a little summary of my life. Um, I just graduated from Lake Forest Academy, which is a small private school outside of Chicago and I'm going to Duke University in the fall. I am the middle child of three, and I have a dog named Walden. And my favorite activity to do is play tennis. So first, what kind of started to get me into like the environmental field and like working for others and like my passion um, to be a part of something like Roots and Shoots is the Center for Conservation Leadership. So I started this program in eighth grade, and this was a series of different trips focused on helping the environment and something bigger than ourselves. Um, so we'd work with kids, we'd work on projects that um, we had a passion for, and through these trips, we would work with um, students from around the area um, and do something that is really meaningful and impactful for the environment. So what my project was, um, was I built mason bee hives. I love bees and mason bees in particular are extremely great pollinators. So this is why I chose my project. So I built mason bee hives all around um, an outdoor laboratory. <laughs> And then I taught um, probably about 600 students about mason bees, um, the importance of pollination, and how each student, specifically the elementary students, um, can do something that will be sustainable and impactful in the future. So then I got introduced to Roots and Shoots. Um, I started a Roots and Shoots club in my high school freshman year, and um, I continued it all throughout high school. Hopefully, I'll be able to start one in college, too. Um, and we did a bunch of different things with my Roots and Shoots club. Um, we went to Bernie's Book Bank, and this is a place that they would help um, students get books in low-income areas in Chicago. Um, to help them learn how to read. Another thing that we do is we would make cards and care packages for um, a hospital in the south of Chicago, um, which is also kind of a low income hospital. And we deliver them to specifically the pediatric patients. And um, I also was a part of something called Semper Fidelis All-American, and this was a program that was mainly about like service above self. And so we did like some volunteer work. This was last summer and it was, a, it was an amazing group. Um, I was really grateful to be a part of it. And last summer, I also participated in Delta Airlines Green Up Youth Advisory Board. So this was a group of students similar to the NYLC, and um, they were all across the United States. And we each were split into groups and worked on a project throughout the year. And then we had a summit um, 
in Atlanta and presented our projects and then they chose a proposal. And they ended up choosing my group's proposal, which was um, changing all of the um, in-flight papers like magazines and um, just any other paper that adds significant amount of waste into the atmosphere. Um, adding more pollution and changing it into a digital screen for um, there to be an interactive experience on board um, and release, reducing the carbon emissions into the environment. And finally, probably my um, most exciting thing that I did for my Roots and Shoots Club is we had an annual fundraiser run for the Jane Goodall Institute. So each year I would design a t-shirt and we'd sell them. And then there would be a fundraiser run. Um, and it was, it was awesome. Every year it got bigger and um, we raised more money. And it was just something that I really loved because I'm a big runner and that's something that I like to do in my free time. And um, Obviously, I love the NYLC, so just combining these two passions of mine was something that was super meaningful to me, especially sharing it with the community and um, just seeing that they supported me and my passion and um, the Jane Goodall Institute was something that was really amazing. Um, we also would work at Ella Farms each year and um, We'd work in harvesting vegetables and um, gardening, and it was awesome. It was a super fun experience. And I'm just so grateful to be part of NYLC, and I miss all of you, and I hope you're staying safe and healthy. Um, but yeah, you, everyone in the council has had such a big impact on my life, and um, I hope that we can see each other soon and just stay well. Thank you so much, Anna. Next up, we have Jonathan. Hi guys, my name is Jonathan and I'll be presenting on mental health during COVID-19. So a brief overview of my project, uh, COVID-19 lockdowns have caused many people to feel alone, which can lead to thoughts of suicide. And their only form of communication is through social media because you're not allowed to meet with your friends or distant relatives uh, during this lockdown. So as my friends were scrolling through Twitter, they found many of these tweets about suicide. So we decided to code a program that would identify people struggling with suicide. And the, in total, this project took about four months. So March was when we started, which was when lockdowns were first initiated to July, um, which is right now. We, also, we had weekly meetings each around one and a half hours. And each person probably spent around 12 hours uh, by themselves. So Twitter. So we took tweets between January and June. January was when we first learned of coronavirus. Uh, June was when New York was leveling off with their, with their cases, and but other states were seeing spikes. So we decided to use Twitter because Twitter result revolves around more text and pictures. So a picture-oriented social media platform would be Instagram. Um, and Twitter already allows for developers to take data. So they have a form that you can submit um, if you want to apply to be a developer. And it was through this that we were able to take data. So sorting through tweets. Um, each person sorted 
uh, through like 500 tweets. So in total, we sorted around 2,000 tweet, tweets. Each tweet was given a level of seriousness from zero to two. So yes, that means that we read through all of them. Um, so a zero would be not serious at all. So it'd be like this, life without risk is not worth living. That would be a piece of advice and not uh, someone with uh, serious suicidal thoughts. A one would be somewhere in between. So we were unsure. So something like how to kill myself without leaving a carbon footprint. That would be, that would be a one. And a two would be uh, on the verge of doing it. So something like this is my suicide note. I'm going to kill myself now. That is a two. So while we are sorting through tweets, we removed retweets and post containing links. So our retweets don't add value to our project because um, you, they're just retweets. Like you just repeat what someone else said for like your own fans or your followers. Those containing links are not important because they have random letters and symbols, which can mess up our program. We also remove symbols like apostrophes and slashes and expanded contractions. So the word don't would become do not. And this was all done so that every tweet would be looked at equally. So a tweet with like uh, uppercase letters would not be looked at equally versus a lowercase uh, lowercase tweet if we didn't do all of this. So the models used, we were deciding between regression and neural networks. So regression is identifying the relationship between an input and an output. So in our project, the input would be any tweet. The output would be a number zero, one, or two. So that's the degree of seriousness that the model will uh, give. Neural network is basically an artificial brain. So it works through gates. So gates are basically conditions that the input has to meet. So something, so for us, our inputs, our inputs were tweets. So the first condition would be like, is this tweet labeled as a two? And then if it was yes, it would move on to the next condition. Uh, what kind of words are in this tweet that make it a level two? And then so on. And then within a neural network, there are three types. So there is a convolution neural network, which is based on images. And as you can imagine, because Twitter doesn't have a lot of image-based tweets, um, this did not do as well as the other two, which are actually focused on text data. So these um, were the made up most of our accuracy, gated recurrent neuron and long short-term memory. So after running through all the code and then uh, find, uh, inputting all the tweets, we concluded that we had an 88% accuracy, which is really good. Um, and then in August, so in about two weeks, we're gonna go through Twitter again, and then we're gonna be adding more inputs. So adding more tweets into our uh, data set. And this is all in hopes of better accuracy. And I say August because hopefully that's when coronavirus dies down. Uh, all the states will see like some sort of looking off. And yeah, that was my mental health presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Up next, we have Will. Hey guys, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, my name is Will Sharuis. I'm a ninth grade student at Ransom Everglades in Miami, Florida. This is my first year as part of the National Youth Leadership Council. I'm going to start with what drove me to be a part of the NYLC. My projects are centered around halting climate change. I have put up some statistics here. If you take a look at these numbers, you will see why my city, once known as the Magic City, is now known as ground zero for sea level rise. To give you a little background of how I got interested in climate change, I wanna give you a little information on my hometown. Miami sits four feet above sea level. My home and my school both happen to sit right on Biscayne Bay. My dad went to my school, but if I ever have kids, mine won't due to climate change. Both my home and my school already flood and both will be uninhabitable 
uninhabitable by the year 2070. In Miami, I spend my free time on the ocean. I row, crew, and fish during the school year, and I spend a lot of time in the nearby Bahamas where I snorkel, free dive, and scuba dive. But the life I have now is changing due to climate change. And right here, I'm gonna play a little clip of those changes. In 2017, Miami was hit by one of the most intense hurricanes ever, Hurricane Irma. The water came up over the seawalls and flooded my backyard. But the floods didn't stop at a few feet inland like they used to. This time, our city flooded all the way out to the airport, which sits in West Miami. Our entire city was underwater. These photos are unbelievable, but they're real. My city is already sinking. But the solutions already exist too. Some of the solutions are even profitable. In my first year on the National Youth Leadership Council, I've used this opportunity to create projects that are solution-based. One of the main things we can do is to ask our elected officials to take immediate action to halt climate change. So I started a project called Take the Florida Climate Pledge. This appeals to many people because it only takes a minute to register your thoughts against climate change and the use of fossil fuels. The results go directly to our elected officials. This project had a lot of success so far locally as I was able to take the results to our city and have Miami declare climate emergency. To me, at this point, it is important to stay away from blame and to keep the conversation solution-based. A second project I started recently was called Avoid the Peril of a Single Story. Share yours. This project is to raise awareness that every voice matters. It is an educational video and then an opportunity to share your own unique cultural background. Minorities are more affected by climate change than any other groups. And so it is important to have an understanding of how they are being affected by the dual problems of climate change and the pandemic. The results of this project are published on the public broadcasting station. A third project I did this year was to gain support for the goals of the United Nations, which has its 75th anniversary this year. The UN goals are very much in line with the purposes of the Jane Goodall Institute. So this project lined up perfectly. After the next slide, I will be sharing a video a bit more about where my NYLC work has led me. This year, I was fortunate to be able to take part in the 25th United Nations Climate Change Conference in Madrid, Spain. I traveled as a delegate with the National Wildlife Federation, which I became involved with last year. They work to raise awareness about climate change and other environmental issues. I wanted to travel to Spain to be an example to others that young people can and need to take part in even the world's most important climate change conferences. I spoke on a panel of youth climate activists about how growing up in Miami has been an amazing experience, but that the climate crisis has caused environmental damage that will affect Miami in the coming decades. At the conference, I was able to attend inspiring speeches from Greta Thunberg, Harrison Ford, and Nancy Pelosi, as well as delegates from many other countries around the world. The highlight was meeting the IPCC scientists. It was disappointing to see that the United States did not participate heavily in the conference, but it was awesome to be a part of this youth movement to halt climate change. Us youth have amazing power to raise awareness and to bring about change. I'm a reluctant speaker, but the issue of climate change requires every voice. So I founded a Roots and Shoots group called We Are Forces of Nature. The goal is to halt climate change and I plan on continuing to create projects that will support the goal. I'm really thankful for the inspiration the other leaders of the National Youth Leadership Council provide and for the support of the Jane Goodall Institute. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will.
Next up, we have Sam Yukta. Um, you'll see that? It looks like it's loading. Yes, I can see it. Okay. <clears throat> so hi, everyone. My name is Sam Yukta, and this is my first year on the NYLC, so a little bit about me. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, born and raised, and my entire philosophy is really around combining STEAM, leadership, and community engagement to really have sustainable social impact. I'm really passionate about biology, computer science, all kinds of music and performance, and language and writing. Apart from NYLC, I'm also a chief science officer and Girl Scout. So I guess I have three main projects to go over today. And uh, as you'll probably see, as I kind of evolve from this project, it really shows how intersectional and connected climate activism and social justice activism and youth empowerment are with STEAM. So my first project was Yuvatech, <clears throat> which is all about engaging, educating, and empowering through STEAM for social good. So Yuvatech was inspired by both my own personal experiences and what I later found to be an international issue. There is a global lack of applicable problem-solving oriented education and technology. Even if you're like me, where I grew up with some opportunities to learn about computer science or different languages, there's a really clear gap between learning how to program in a language and actually applying it to create technology that solves social issues. And this is really where I feel we need to improve the most because honestly, technology, I believe is just a tool towards solving community issues. And so this is where I also wanted to create a change and really take a new perspective on solving and um, addressing the lack of representation and opportunity gap in STEAM through my work in Ubitech. So my solution to this issue was the Hackinar, a unique hybrid of the Hackathon, which is a short-term sort of competition where teams work to build some kind of technology really fast over usually 24 to 48 hours, and a seminar where people just come to learn. I wanted to definitely gear this experience towards younger students and inspire this love for empowerment technology in them while they're still young. And so I wanted to make it approachable and I use the Hack in Our format to do that. I had a team of 11 mentors, specialized managers and advisors, and we also created original ideation curriculum to bridge the gap between our overall goal of STEAM for social good and technology and application to what we also had in terms of more technical curriculum with um, Python and JavaScript and other programming languages. This curriculum was really designed to take students from observing their communities, really similar to what the Root and Shoots uh, Force of Formula is in terms of observing your community, community mapping, and going from there to actually having a built flowchart and product plan for their original programming artifacts. Our hack and was attended by 25 students. We had three keynote speakers and five youth and professional mentors. And we also had really key partnerships with Major League Hacking, Hack Club, Girl Scouts of Greater Atlanta, Chief Science Officer Program, and many other programs. As a result of Uvatech, I think my leadership skills and my community engagement and so much more were so greatly impacted. And as a result, we also have many more programs coming in the future. Most notably, Yuva Hacks is our virtual event that's going to be happening this fall, and it's going to be open internationally. So I really hope to get uh, a lot more uh, engagement on a global scale. And we'll really be taking it to the next level and really combining tech with social justice, given the amount of social unrest and um, need for this kind of innovation at this specific time in our history. Uh, as a result of Yuva Tech, I'm also involved in a few different other programs, including Georgia Institute of Technology's BioCrowd Studio program, where we also really focus on democratizing and really pioneering the distributed research model and making sure that research is accessible to people all over the Atlanta area, high school students all over the Atlanta area, and making sure that it's an experience that be open to everyone. I'm also a computer science instructor and curriculum developer with the Mavis Academy, and I'm on the Ch Georgia City Science Officers Cabinet, where I work to really bring the skills and experiences that I gained through Yuba Tech to the entire program. To learn more, you can visit our website, uh, you can find us on social media at, at Yuvatech and our Roots and Shoots project page. My second project uh, in light of the COVID-19 situation uh, was the Atlanta Mask Project. So I live in Atlanta, as I said before, and there's a really severe lack of personal protective equipment, or PPE, in our community centers, in our hospitals and healthcare organizations, especially in the metro Atlanta area. And there's also a really clear and researched and proven link between 
COVID-19 susceptibility and socioeconomic status. And I realized that it was just so unjust and completely unfair that your socioeconomic status could have any impact on your susceptibility to such a devastating disease. And so I wanted to do something about it. I couldn't just let these numbers continue to rise and just sit idle and hope for the best. So here, inspired by the work of the Love to Share Foundation uh, Mask Initiative, starting in April 2020, I coordinated a group of around 30 volunteers. And since April, we've donated, created and donated over 1,500 masks to multiple major hospitals in the Atlanta area, including Grady Hospital, Emory, Wellstar, many others. Um, and we also partnered with the Emory Urban Health Initiative to kind of supplement and work together to really reach their community centers and people who they already had partnerships with. Uh, that's a photo of me and my brother with our first uh, phase of uh, masks after maybe a couple, couple weeks of partnering. And that's a picture with me and Dr. Moore, the coordinator of the Emory Urban Health Initiative. In the slide. But uh, to learn more, you can visit our website, atlantamaskproj.wordpress.com, find us online at, at Atlanta Mask Proj and our Ruth and Shoots project page. And finally, uh, as sort of a hybrid of these last two projects, I created hashtag Steam for Justice, which is coming very soon uh, to a digital platform near you. So this is more of a social justice campaign, and it was really inspired by my recent participation in the Tech Girls program, which is a um, a digital exchange program, it was made virtual, that's designed to combine different aspects of advocacy, whether it be the UN SDGs or uh, community impact or global earth warriors and that kind of uh, environmentalism. And so we were all encouraged to collaborate with students and young women from all over the Middle East and North Africa regions. We came together and built all these beautiful campaigns that are all based on solving problems in our community using technology. So my campaign vision for hashtag Sing for Justice is a future where everyone, but especially marginalized youth, feel empowered, aware, and fearless in taking action, and taking action specifically through technology and STEAM as a whole to advocate and create real sustainable change. So my goals for this campaign are one, to create a BIPOC mental health campaign. And I realized that mental health has obviously been um, very, very kind of in flux due to quarantine and all of that, but especially because of social justice issues, BIPOC mental health has become really threatened. And I've experienced that myself as a person of color. So I wanted to create a campaign that not only provided opportunities for reflection and improving mental health, but also reducing that sense of sort of hopelessness and lack of control that some people can feel and really provide actionable ways to contribute and improve the state of social justice issues in your community as part of this mental health campaign. So I'm planning on launching this uh, by August 30th. It'll be all over social media. So I hope to see y'all there. Second, uh, as I mentioned before with Yuva Hacks, <clears throat> I want to host an online workshop for youth uh, where I teach tech skills related to social justice. So sort of building on what I already established and what I learned from the in-person event last year, I wanna adapt it to be virtual and really focus on how students can make immediate change using these foundational tech skills and build really innovative products and projects that have action. Finally, I want to create a platform to showcase BIPOC excellence online, such as a blog. And this will probably be a recurring thing. I'm aiming for four to five posts a month, and I want to launch by September 15th. Related to that, if anyone wants to be featured or write a feature for this blog, please let me know. Um, I'll have contact information in just a sec, because I'd love to feature the amazing youth talent that we have on our NY NYLC. So thank you all so much for your time. Uh, feel free to reach out with any questions if you want to learn more about any of these projects or want to collaborate. I've listed the websites for my projects here, and you can also email me um, at the email list here. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Next up, we have Gabby. Hi. Hi there. Can you see me? Yes, I can. I can also hear you. Um, and can you see my screen? It looks like it's loading now. Perfect. Okay. So, hi, my name is Gabby. I am a rising senior in high school, and I've been a part of Roots and Shoots 
for all of my high school for three years, I'm going to the fourth, and I'm a first year NYLC member. So I kind of wanted to talk about two of my favorite projects. Um, so the first of them would be the, our Thanksgiving food drive and our penny wars at my school. Um, we kind of hit the ground running with this. Uh, my school starts like late August, beginning of September, and immediately we start work on this just because it does take up a lot of time and it is a lot of work. Um, basically the way that it works is for two weeks in November, we collect food item donations, and this would be in different categories or types of Thanksgiving foods. For example, um, cranberry sauce or mashed potato mix, or sometimes people just donate anything. So it could be, you know, baked good mix or breakfast foods, it doesn't really matter. So we collect foods um, in all those different types of categories. And then part of the reason why we start so early is because we have to collect and decorate cardboard, box, cardboard boxes. Um, we typically use like printer paper boxes from the office and we have to collect and decorate over a hundred of these because we make a lot of boxes. So that takes up most of our time in the beginning. And then once the two weeks are up, we pack those boxes with a couple of each food type. So it kind of depends on the family. Uh, larger families will get more items, but you would say that, you know, maybe a couple of each category of those different food types are put into this box and all the extras go to our local food pantry. Um, another thing that we do prior to the two weeks is we kind of label all those boxes by number. So um, in specific, certain families that are bigger will have a different number. If certain families have children, then we make sure to write that on the box so they can get baby food and everything. And then all this kind of accumulates to one delivery day where we set all those boxes out we put in fresh produce and we um, add turkeys. And then we have drivers who volunteer to drop them off at people's houses. And then I guess the second part of this two week adventure um, is our penny wars. So my school is split up into five houses. That's just how they split up the, the student body. And so each house has a house jar pennies count for positive points and silver coins are negative points, silver coins and dollars. And the most positive points wins. And so we kind of turn it into a little bit of a competition, but healthy competition never hurt anybody. Um, and we do that kind of the same thing for the food drive, but it's more focused heavily on the penny wars because people can sabotage each other by putting silver coins in other buckets and everything. And this money is used to buy turkeys to put in those boxes. Um, all of our fresh produce is donated by a local bakery. Um, and I guess a little bit back to the competitive part of it. Um, one of the things that I like the most um, is there's a specific administrator at our school. Um, this specific house kind of has won this portion of it for multiple years in a row. And so every time he wins, he loves to come into the student center really dramatic, starts blaring, we are the champions over the speakers. And then just, you know, goes over and collects his bucket and then like retreats. And so like this food drive has been going on for multiple years has become a tradition at our school. And that's definitely been a part of the tradition as well. These are a couple of the pictures. So we have um, over here some of the uh, boxes, pennies, some of the cans, um, again, more pennies and the boxes again. And so this has, you know, we've had a lot of success over the years from it. I know that this past year, we've raised um, over 3000 individual items and raised hundreds of dollars. And so it's always been something that I look forward to, even though it is a lot of work, you know, with the planning processes, process, um, we do end up, it always ends up being extremely successful. Um, and one of the reasons I like it so much is because of its effect on the income inequality in my town. Uh, my town has pretty large economic separation. And so these boxes go to low income families that register with a program in our town. Uh, me personally, I know of a lot of people that do struggle economically. Um, I'm an immigrant, so I have family members in um, my country back home that struggle with that as well. But I, at the end of the day, I love seeing how my town comes together and kind of 
puts in that effort in the two weeks, even though it may be a little bit for the for the competitive portion of it. Um, it's really great seeing everyone work together um, for one thing. And then one thing I, you know, a little project I wanted to add just because it's also been one of my favorites has been our Roots and Shoots seminar, which we did for the first time this year in February. Uh, my school hosts the diversity week. And so they asked us to speak and talk about Jane and Roots and Shoots and everything. So we ended up speaking to over 80 kids of our peers, basically. And we talked to them about Jane and Roots and Shoots and we walked them through the steps. So our four step formula, explain community mapping, and we had everyone create their own projects. And this was a total pleasant surprise. I think going into it, I was really nervous because I was like, well, you know, I don't think people are really going to listen or really care about it. They're only here because they're forced to be. But the end result was amazing. I had this one group that like, we separated everyone into people, plants and animals. And this one group, they came up with this plan about, you know, eutrophication and algae. And I was like, you did that in seven minutes? Like, that's incredible. And so um, I think it also kind of speaks to the power that you have as a speaker and an educator um, to empower individuals who may have not known that they had a passion for certain things. So I really enjoyed that. Um, here's, you know, two pictures of us pre presenting some of the projects. Um, so yeah, thank you. Those are two of my favorite projects um, coming up. Uh, this is kind of, you know, my friends and I made up this like, little project from a seedling of an idea that we've had for a long time. Uh, most of us are immigrants or have come from immigrant backgrounds. So we've kind of seen firsthand how, you know, difficult living in a politically turbulent environment can be, especially when paired with poverty that kind of is really rampant through, through the country. And so we kind of created a plan and a website. Um, the website is called firstgenforchange.org. I can put it in the chat later. But, um, you know, it's still in its beginning stages, not everything is planned out, but we kind of had the idea that we wanted to create um, or compile lists of really reliable nonprofits. So say, you know, like one list for each country where people could donate to, and it's just a medium to have all of your information in one place. And we really hope to expand this in the future, maybe have some ambassadors, maybe come up with our own nonprofit situation, um, we're not exactly sure what it, where it'll take us, but I'm extremely excited to see, you know, what the future will hold for that. Um, and with that, I'd like to say thank you to the NYLC for giving me the opportunity to share my story. Thank you so much for sharing, Gabby. Up next, we have Maddie. Hi, guys. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Can you all hear me just to make sure? Uh-huh, we can. Okay. Um, hmm. Let's see. Okay. Can you all see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. So I'm Maddie, and I'm a rising 10th grader in San Marino High School. I live here in um, LA, California, and I started the Thriving Hive Project. So what is the Thriving Hive Project, also known as TTHP? So it helps spread awareness about bees and their purpose for food sustainability and how they help our environment. And I mainly focus on educating the youth in my community, and I have done three projects. Um, so a little bit about beehives. So they're the main housing for bees that you see on a daily basis, like every day, your regular honeybee. And here's what it would look like on the outside. And there's basically three parts to a beehive, which is the box, which is this thing right here, frames, which hold the honeycomb, and then basically the comb that goes inside the frames. And so a beehive is basically like a house and each box is like a different story. And the frames are the rooms that hold all the items. And so there's three different bees inside the hive. There's um, the foragers, which are all female. The queen bee, which is in charge of all the, in charge of every other bee. And drones, which are the male bees. So what is a bee hotel? 
Um, bee hotels are mainly used by stationary bees and stationary bees are bees that do not require a hive and are um, like solitary, hence the name, and do not have any queen and do not work together at all. So they go into little holes like this and they store pollen, lay their eggs and rest. And here's a good example to where you can see the pollen, the larva, and then an egg is over here and it's all separated by mud, keeping them um, at safe distance from each other. And my main goal is to help mason bees because they're less known about and not as many people are helping them, unlike our honeybee. So the first project I, I did was um, planting a drought tolerant, pollinator safe, um, bunch of other like crazy names because my um, Rotary Club wanted to do a garden that could help all species and also help the environment. So I went to Theodore Payne Foundation and I basically went and picked out plants that fit all the categories that my um, Rotary Club at my school was looking for. And this project I did when I was in eighth grade. So I started Roots and Shoots two years ago. And here I am planning with all the Rotary members and here I am presenting to them about how they can help bees and our community. And then here's an example of other pollinating plants that we um, could have used but didn't. So the Black Eyed Susan is a great one. Also butterfly weed and milkweed, hollyhocks and the California poppy. So my second project was installing a beehive in my community. So this is the first time I ever actually have done beekeeping. And so that was a pretty great experience for me. So we started off with one box here and we were able to make it to three boxes, but I wasn't able, I don't know why I didn't take pictures of that. And here's a nuke, which is how you install a hive. You first get it like this, where you can transport the bees and then you end up putting it in the beehive wherever it is. But then the beehive ended up getting infested invaded by hive mites, which are these things right here, or hive beetles, and it ended up killing off all the bees in the hive. So um, the bees were no longer there and I had to start from scratch. So my third project was putting up bee hotels, which are these things right here. And I had two designs, um, a circle one and a teardrop, which I got um, donated to me by an organization which I do not remember the name of, but yeah. Um, so I put up eight bee hotels around my community with the head arbor of the community. And we were able to actually have some mason bees come in here and um, stir their pollen, lay eggs and rest. And then here's um, a thing I put on Roots and Shoots. I made a video which is right here, but I don't think we have time to watch it. And so if you wanna check it out, it's there on their Roots and Shoots Instagram page. And so my fourth project was reinstalling a new hive. So here's the nuke that I was talking about, the thing that transports the bees resting on top of the beehive so that we can then put it inside of the actual hive. And then our hive actually ended up um, getting um, infested with um, Africanized bees, which um, made the hive really angry. And every time we went in to inspect it, they would come after us and try and sting us. And it was really bad. So we had to requeen the hive, which is a new experience for me, which is really cool. And so here's how I fundraised. I went to many Able to get into the sanitation fair from LAEF. So some upcoming projects um, will be second day denim and I'll be doing a denim drive and I'll work alongside a company called Blue Jeans Go Green which upcycles the denim into insulation for housing and um, by doing this it's a new eco-friendly way to reduce denim because there's 
over 450 million pieces of denim that end up in landfills each year. And with the denim, I'm not able to donate um, and use that. I'm not able to donate and won't be used to become um, insulation for homes. I'll be turning into dog and cat beds and toys and then filling those up with uh, single use plastics because um, I know for me, my dog really likes um, the sound that water bottles make. And how you can contact me is here on Instagram. And also I have a website, um, thethrivinghiveproject.com, where um, uh, Claire, our other fellow Roots and Shoots leader, um, her photos are featured there. And yeah, that's it. Thank you so much, Maddie. Up next, we have Rhea presenting. Um, hello. Um, share my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. I can hear you also. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ria, and this is my first year on the NYLC. I am so lucky to be a part of this group and to get the opportunity to connect with others who are so similar to me. And I have learned so much this past year, and everyone's projects are like awesome. A little bit about me is that I have always cared about endangered animals ever since second grade, where I did a report on tigers, which are now my favorite animal. At seven years old, I learned that there used to be nine subspecies of tigers on earth, but three are now extinct because of humans. And now the South China tiger is practically extinct with fewer than 50 tigers left, all in zoos. Climate change is threatening their habitats and food sources, which then makes them more vulnerable to poaching and conflicts within communities. And there are so many other species that are in danger of going extinct because of climate change as well. Another fact about me is that I love to read and there are so many books where the protagonists are able to take action even though they're so young, which got me to reflect on changes I wanted to see and inspired me to act and rise up. I didn't want to wait for it for a time that's best to make a difference. I wanted to be in the room where change happens. As I learned more about the effects of climate change, I found out that, like many catastrophes, the effects will hit disadvantaged groups first. A few other youth leaders discussed this as well. Death, does, death may not discriminate between the sinners and the saints, but climate change does discriminate. I created a group, Green Teens 101, with my friends to bring awareness to the issue of climate change in our local community. As I'm sure everyone in this call knows, climate change is a huge problem. And if we don't act soon, it will be too late to fully reverse its effects. I realized how lucky we are to be alive right now when we can still do something. Growing up privileged, my community doesn't really see the true impact of climate change. And once we do, it will definitely be too late. We, when we looked at our community, Green Teens 101, realized that there was so much plastic waste, which then contributes to pollution. Only 1% of plastic bags actually gets returned to be recycled. Everything else is sent to a landfill or makes its way to the ocean where a turtle may think it's jellyfish and eat it. So we decided to focus on single use plastic bags. An average American uses 10 billion plastic bags a year and this number can easily go down if most of us simply use a reusable bag. We created an Instagram to share this information with more people. We shot two birds with one stone, the issue of climate change awareness and single use plastics. Uh, we stood outside stores in our area, handing out these free reusable bags. And we were able to interact with consumers and encourage them to stop using single use plastics by informing them of the detrimental effects of plastic on our environment. At the same time, we were able to raise awareness of climate change and how important conservation acts are. We also hosted a few beach cleanups to try to clean up our community. There's a million things we haven't done, but if we lay a strong enough foundation, we can hopefully pass it on. Once the pandemic hit, once the pandemic hit, we took a break from our green teens activities. So we decided to simply brainstorm what we could do once we get out of quarantine. I turned my focus on helping students in my community get through the pandemic. I started the homework brigade on March 16th and since then, more than 80 students have signed up. Basically, we pair each student with a high school tutor 
who will tutor the student in any subject they choose, including math, science, history, music, and even chess. This gives parents a break from homeschooling and gives children some sort of schedule based on their needs and availability. Also, it gives the children to ch a chance to interact with someone other than their family. And what was really cool is that we were featured in one of our local newspapers. I also spent time on a few side projects this past year. For example, before quarantine, I taught some coding classes called Project Spark at my local library to introduce students to computer science and also teach them problem solving and shows that there are multiple ways to answer the same question, which is like a life skill. Also, my school hosted an event called Cypher, which introduce, introduces computer science to middle school girls. I was part of the organizing team and my job was to look for sponsors. We ended up hosting the workshop online through Zoom. It was a full day workshop. In the morning, we taught the attendees CSS and HTML and had a break for lunch then put everyone in breakout rooms to create a website of their own. We even had a guest speaker, Professor Kristen Dana from Rutgers, who taught electrical and computer engineering. And we were hoping to give the middle school girls a role model and encourage them to pursue a STEM field. And this is what I spent my time this year doing. I also added a few book recommendations in case anyone has extra time to read in quarantine. Also, hopefully some of you have caught the Hamilton quotes I sprinkled in. I love musicals almost as much as I love books. Um, if you never listened to Hamilton, they probably sounded a little weird, but like Hamilton, I am not throwing away my shot. Yep, thank you. Thank you so much, Rhea. Up next, we have Renee. Hi, let me share my screen. Alrighty. Okay. Can you see it all right? Yep, you're good to go. Lovely. So uh, first, I'm still thoroughly enjoying all the Hamilton references. Thank you, Rhea. That was so great. Um, but hi, I'm Renee. I've been on the council for almost six years now, and I'm a junior at Tufts University, where I study environmental engineering with a focus on race and justice. So uh, for those that don't know, um, I'm also really passionate about environmental racism, and I plan to address the health disparities that are caused in communities of color due to environmental racism. And for context, environmental racism is the fact that um, Black, Indigenous, and other people of color disproportionately face the burden of environmental hazards in the United States. And um, I've loved hearing other people talk about that. So important. Two fun facts about me. Uh, in the corner here is my cat Penny. She's great. <laughs> Any chance to show her off in a presentation, I'd love to. And I also really love Jurassic Park. So uh, when I was in high school, uh, I was a member of our Roots and Shoots Club for four years, and I was a president for three of those years. And I actually went to the same high school as Gabby. So Gabby, all the work you're doing is so lovely. Love to see it. Um, and yeah, we did a, a, a great variety of projects. I think Gabby really touched on some amazing details, but um, for further things that I was involved in, in terms of project impact, um, over my time of um, leadership, we were able to collect over 10,000 non-perishable goods for our local food bank. We collected thousands of dollars for our local homeless shelter, and we created care packages for the uh, local homeless shelter. Uh, we aided in banning single-use plastic bags. On my own time, a project I really love to do um, because I love art is actually creating um, cards for elderly members of my community and um, for Valentine's Day and combating senior isolation because that's a big problem. You know, a lot of older people sometimes spend Valentine's Day alone and they're not used to that. And it can be a really tough time. So I used to make bunches of cards every year and I really love art and integrating that with justice work. So that was really enjoyable. So things that I'm working on now, because college is different, we have um, a lot less time and we're focusing on studies, but things I've been up to. So uh, one thing is that I've actually been knitting hat for, hats for premature babies and addressing black maternal mortality. If you didn't know, um, black women in the United States are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than their white counterparts. And um, this has nothing to do with black women themselves. It's medical racism that is um, invested in our healthcare system and the tools that we're still utilizing in our healthcare system and so on. So this project of mine is really addressing, raising awareness of this for one. And then I'm also sending the hats and cards to black moms and just passing on my congratulations and appreciation for black women. And I'm also thinking of tying in a component of raising money for organizations that support black women um, during the pregnancy process as um, by raising 
or educating other black women to be advocates for themselves or have um, midwives and doulas. So that's really important. Another big project of mine is I've, I, so I'm an engineer. I'm actually the only black woman engineer in my cohort at Tufts. And um, that's definitely disappointing. Um, not a con consequence again of um, black people and their intelligence or abilities themselves, but systemic racism and how it's manifested in access to higher institutions for higher education and so on. So in my department, I've been having and leading more conversations on how STEM isn't neutral. Our personal biases as scientists is infused in our work and who we study and the questions that we ask. And because STEM is a predominantly white field and male field, we're getting a limited perspective and understanding of issues. So um, on this slide, I featured a diagram on redlining, which has to do with how racism is infused in our urban planning and housing discrimination. And I also featured Henrietta Lacks, who is a black woman who without her consent, um, cells were taken from her, which created an immortal stem cell line that um, has have been used to create uh, vaccines and really invaluable advancements in medicine that we all benefit from today, but it was done without her consent and her own family actually doesn't have access to health care. And um, that kind of exploitation of black people in STEM and indigenous people is the usual and it's uh, not okay. And we don't celebrate um, the contributions of these people in these spaces. So um, my work is really developing curriculum as well as having um, a review of materials that are in my college's um, classrooms and making sure that we have various narratives represented in our work. And finally, a personal research project I'm working on is a site, it's a research blog called Cultivating COVID. And it basically is outlining how the, US, um, the US's structural racism has caused a disproportionate impact of COVID-19 in communities of color. So if you don't know this, um, black people in the United States are actually 2.5 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than um, white people. And you know, it's racist thinking to say, to hear that and say, oh, well, are black people socially distancing? Are they not washing their hands? What's wrong with them? And it's anti-racist thinking to hear that information and say, what systems, histories, and policies have shaped this outcome? And if you think of it that way, then you'll realize that um, housing discrimination, environmental racism, and among many other things have compounded certain uh, health issues in communities of color, which make them more vulnerable to COVID-19. And uh, I love this tree. It's by Danielle Cook, this diagram. It's lovely because it outlines just a few of those causes and um, the roots of the issues themselves, which is systemic racism. So as someone that wants to be a health professional, um, I always try and remind people, you know, uh, a risk factor is not race itself, it's racism. Racism is the root issue that's causing the trends that we're seeing today. So that was a lot of information, um, but with that all said, I wanna say I've been really enjoying everyone's presentations. Thank you for listening and Black Lives Matter. Thank you so much, Renee. Next up, we have Noah. Uh, hi everyone, I am just sharing my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Great, so hi, my name is Noah. I'm a second year NYLC member. A bit about me, I was have been born and raised in Los Angeles, California. I'm a recent graduate of Calabasas High School where I was an ASB technology commissioner. I was a marketing director for my school's newspaper. I was a National Honor Society member and I was on the varsity comedy sports team. I serve on the board of the Jewish World Watch Teen Ambassador Program. I serve on the City of Calabasas Environmental Commission and I write for the Hidden Hills Magazine. So my, here's a list of my main Roots and Shoes project from this past school year. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about all of it. So as most of you remember, on September 27th, 2019, there were a ton of climate strikes all across the country. And I wanted, I wanted to go to the walkouts in downtown LA and the protests, but I couldn't miss class that day. Like I had exams. And a lot of teachers wanted to be a part of it, but obviously they couldn't miss school. And we wanted to do something civil, 
and somewhat powerful. So we encouraged everyone to wear green. And we had over 250 participants and I at nutrition that day, we blasted music and we took pictures and talked to our friends about climate change. And we even were featured in the Acorn newspaper, which is our local paper that's read by about 100,000 people. And it gave Roots and Shoots a little plug too, which is nice. My next project was the Calabasas and Mayor's Monarch Pledge. So through the National Wildlife Federation, they've set up the Mayor's Monarch Pledge, which is a coalition of mayors all across the country working to save the endangered monarch butterfly species. So for your mayor to sign it, they have to commit to three actions. And there's a big list, but the first one is to issue a proclamation about the cause. So Calabasas Mayor David Shapiro issued a proclamation and he was nice enough to offer certificates of recognition to my group. So you can see this is my board right here. And we got really nice certificates and we're really grateful for that. And then with money we received from a mini grant, we planted a hundred milkweed and other native plants and created a milkweed monarch butterfly garden. And this photo just shows half of it, but it's beautiful and the plants are really big now. My next project, which has been ongoing for about six years within the group, even before I came to the school, is the CHS Native Wildlife Habitat Certification the Trail Project. So the National Wildlife Federation has the following requirements for a certified wildlife habitat. So food, water, cover, home for young, and sustainability. And these are the actions that we, not all of the actions were complete. We have all of the, we fulfilled all the requirements, but we weren't, we weren't able to get to bird bath or nesting boxes or bee houses. Like it literally happened right before the pandemic. So this is what the area looked like before. The project had been started, but it was basically a barren and deserted spot on campus. People were afraid to walk there at night. It was kind of dangerous, big rocks everywhere and just not a good place. So we planted over 53 California native plants and we installed a drip irrigation system and the areas, the plants are gonna grow into shape and it's really gonna be awesome. And it's gonna be an ongoing Roots and Cheese project for years to come and I'm really proud of it. My next thing, so with everything that was going on with the pandemic, we, since the beginning of this year, I wanted to plan a big die-in for Earth Day and we were going to have, like, I'm not sure if you know what a die-in is, but it's basically like a, it's like a, it's a big demonstrate, it's like a protest demonstration, but that obviously couldn't happen. So we did virtual Earth Week Spirit Week. So people would post to their Instagram stories and we would reshare them onto my school's social media page. So we had Meatless Monday, Trash Tuesday, Wear Green Wednesday, Throw Out Renaissance Thursday, and Finish Fossil Fuels Friday. And this was just an amazing community event. We had over 500 participants. It got our name out there and we are really proud of how it went. And then my next project, which I did with my family. So for the past, I'd say 10 years, my dad and I have been propagating succulents on the side of my house. And it's just been like an ongoing project. It's super easy, super fun. And we were thinking of ways that we could contribute to 
the COVID-19 fundraising and we thought, why not sell our succulents and all of the proceeds will go to COVID relief. So we sold, as of now, we've sold over 60 plants and we've raised over a thousand dollars for COVID-19 relief. And it's literally on my sidewalk, you go and you pay what you can on Venmo to my dad. And it's been really great. The neighborhood loves it. I've met a lot of cool people from it and it's just been awesome. So if you're in the Los Angeles area, hit me up and come on by. And that's all. Thank you so much for your time. And you can check out my high school's Roots and Shoots Instagram page at Calabasas Roots and Shoots. Thank you. Thank you so much, Noah. Up next, we have Isabel. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Fantastic. Okay, is that coming up? It is, uh-huh. Great. So my name is Isabel. I'm from Western North Carolina and this is my first year on the NYLC. Just to preface, my issues of importance are climate change, specifically sea level rise and ocean acidification, also animal rights and gender equity. So for my intro to activism, I've had a deep love for the outdoors from a young age and have had the privilege to grow up on a um, nature reserve in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, and I'm a strong believer that we protect what we love. So I think that that connection to nature has um, been a huge motivator for my environmentalism. Um, around the age of nine, I learned about factory farming and became vegan, which kind of started me on the journey of understanding the intersectionalities between these different issues and how factory farming contributes to um, climate change. Um, and my mom was also a national organizer for the 2017 Women's March. Um, which was a super powerful behind the scenes look into um, all the work that goes behind such huge events um, and kind of started getting me interested in organization. So I actually had the amazing opportunity of being invited to Antarctica at the age of 11. Um, polar explorer Robert Swan, who's the first man to walk to the North and South Poles and um, started the organization called 2041 Foundation, which aims to continue protecting Antarctica from drilling. Um, he invited me to go with him on an expedition and I fundraised to send my dad and me um, in the next few months. Um, and this trip really stoked my passion for climate justice as I was able to see such dramatic examples of climate change right in front of my eyes. Um, and I also learned about intersectional environmentalism and started making the connections between the rising sea level of my hometown in Charleston, South Carolina, um, and the melting icebergs that were in front of me in Antarctica. I also love using art as activism. So I've raised money for nonprofits with violin by busking on the street and also playing at events. The picture on the bottom right is of me at the opening of the Sea Turtle Care Center at the South Carolina Aquarium, um, which I think is such an amazing organization to support. Um, and also creative writing for a cause is something that drives me. Um, on the right, you can see a picture of me performing at the National Press Center um, with a Pulitzer Center event. Um, I spoke a found poem that I wrote um, about malnutrition in Venezuela. Um, and got to connect with amazing journalists from around the world who are advocating through their reporting and creativity. And um, some projects that I've done over the past year um, at my boarding school in Washington, DC, um, is I removed plastic water bottles from the school cafeteria. Um, we had a super small student body 
Um, but we were going through about 200 plastic water bottles every lunch, even though there were um, water stations and um, water fountains right on that floor. Um, so I successfully campaigned to have um, my school renegotiate their contract and um, discontinue uh, providing plastic water bottles. Um, and I also organized about 40 students for the September climate march, um, which was a super amazing way to get some of my peers involved in an issue that matters so much to me um, and to learn more about it myself. And I really love going to protests and marches. I think it's an amazing way to build positive and hopeful energy amidst so many uh, seemingly heavy um, issues. Um, and I think it's also a way to learn about um, problems and hear new perspectives from speakers. Um, the picture at the bottom left here was um, me and some friends at the National Period Day March, um, which was the first time that I'd learned about uh, menstrual poverty and um, stigma. And so I think it's a super interesting way to engage with new problems um, and really be a part of the activism community wherever you live. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you, Isabel. All right, well, this, come, this brings us to the end of our presentations. Thank you to everybody who tuned in and for those working behind the scenes as our youth leaders presented on their work. Um, thank you to each member of the council, um, not only for presenting today, but for the incredible work that you are all doing. Um, I, I think your stories will inspire many others to take action in similar ways, or at least to explore what their passions might be um, and consider how, the, how each of us can contribute um, to a better world. Um, you can find out more about each member of the council um, on rootsandshoots.org org and uh, even read about how to join the council yourself if that's something you're interested in. Um, the, a recording of this live session will be available to watch again and again on our YouTube channel after we complete the live stream. And now I'm going to ask all of the members of the council to turn on their cameras and wave goodbye to everybody watching. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. That's it for today.